Hello, everyone. Welcome. First, I'd like to just let you know that before we get started, um, that this program is being recorded and it will be available on the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum and Classical Theater of Harlem's Facebook and YouTube pages, as well as dykemanfarmhouse.org after tonight. Um, I'll give everyone a few minutes to trickle into the room and then we'll get started. Feel free to uh, let us know in the chat where you're joining us from. Quiet chat tonight. Oh, Laura from Sleepy Hollow. Hi, Laura. Hi, Antonella. Okay, we'll give people a one more minute and then we'll get started. I don't want to leave people waiting. Hello, Carnahan's. All right, it is 6.02, I say we get started. So welcome everyone, welcome back to the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum's uh, virtual lecture series talking about race matters, join the conversation. My name is Meredith Horsford and I'm the executive director here at the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum. We are delighted to continue this lecture series that began in August of 2020, which was so successful that we've continued it as a biannual series. So thank you to those of you who are returning and welcome to our newcomers. This four week series hosted in partnership with the Classical Theater of Harlem centers around social justice and advocacy, how advocacy groups and arts and cultural organizations participate and lead in social justice movements. This series was created at a time of great unrest in this country due to the murder of unarmed black people, as well as, as the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our goal throughout has been to encourage people to come together and engage in conversation on a topic that can sometimes be uncomfortable. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few features on Zoom. Please use the chat box, which you're already using over here on the right, um, to say hello to other attendees and to ask Melissa, our development and our Director of Development and Community Engagement, any technical assess assistance questions that you may have. During the lecture, if you have questions for our speakers, please click the Q&A button at the bottom and we will answer those questions during or at the end of the talk. We at the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum thank everyone for joining us this evening. We feel strongly that our programming remains free of charge so that it is accessible to all. The response to this series, this lecture series has been overwhelming and there is clearly a need for us to talk more about the issues that divide us and the issues that unite us as Americans. As a small nonprofit organization, we rely on grants and donations to support these programs. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, the Honorable Udonis Rodriguez, New York City Council District 10, and former Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Additional funding is provided by TD Bank. If you would like to make a donation to help us continue our community-focused programming, it is greatly appreciated. In lieu of a donation, we are also selling some very cool Dykeman Farmhouse Museum merch, which you can see in the chat. A purchase helps support our cause, further research, and provide educational programming. Tonight, we are joined by Susan Natasha Gonzalez, a registered art therapist and educator, and Deputy Director of Institutional Growth at Fresh Youth Initiatives, and Beatriz Oliva, a licensed mental health counselor, PhD student, and clinician at Fresh Youth Initiatives. The daily practice of social justice requires discerning the needs of those we serve. How can organizations assess and respond to community demands to develop programs and provide support for participants and families? The provision of academic programs non-traditional social, emotional, and mental health services within the academic setting will be explored. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Susan and Beatriz, 
presenting Flo E. Movimiento in the Heights, Social Justice and Advocacy in High School. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I'm going to share um, our um, PowerPoint presentation and we are going to begin um, with, um, Beatrice is gonna lead us through uh, a, an interactive, brief interactive exercise to get us started for this evening. Beatriz. Hi everyone. Hi Juan, seeing the chat, we just logged in. So I'm, I'm gonna do a super simple five cents uh, exercise, grounding mindfulness exercise for therapists. So, you know, we like to go there. Um, the exercise is called five senses and it's just a guideline to, that you can adapt in any situation if you're feeling a little anxious or you're just feeling like you just need to be in the moment, right? Like you kind of get distracted. A lot of stuff is going on and we wanna bring you all into this space right now in this conversation. So all I'm gonna ask um, folks to do, sit as comfortably as you can in your chair. I'm a little cold, so I'm leaning, so I apologize for that. But if you're not as cold as I am, sit back if you can. And I want you to be open to this experience of your five senses, all right? So if you also feel comfortable, you can also uh, pop in the chat the things, the prompts that I give you. The first thing I want you to notice are five things that you see in your space. Look around, whatever your eyes lay on, whatever you know takes your attention, it's five things. It could be anything that you don't normally notice. It could be a shadow, it could be the corner, some corner in your room that you realize you need to paint, trash that you need to take out, anything. Now I want you to notice four things that you feel. Bring awareness to the things that you might be feeling against your skin, something like your pants, a breeze that you might be feeling, the window open, or the chair that you're sitting on, the sweater that you have on. how your hands feel against each other. And now take a moment to listen. What are three things that you hear? Something in the background, a car honking, creek on the floor, a cat meowing, or even silence. Please share in the chat. I think somebody did mention something. What are two things you smell? What are some scents that you might normally filter out, whether they're the good ones or the not so good ones? Ooh, grinding coffee. That is both my favorite scents and my favorite sounds. <laughs> and lastly, what's one thing you can taste? Focus on the one thing you can taste right now in this very moment could be the coffee that I just took, the sip that I just took, the way that your mouth, a lot of coffee and water, or even how the air tastes. I'm gonna sit with that. <laughs> I'm being honest, the gummy bears I just ate. <laughs> it's great. And if you feel comfortable, Please share how that experience was in the space, in the chat. Relaxing. Yeah. 
made you thirsty, same. <laughs> Definitely for that coffee <laughs> and the gummies. So moving on, what brings you here? Why did you decide to attend this, this lecture? Folks wanna put in the chat. An activity to former, to your former Washington Heights community. Thank you, Thank you Angela. <laughs> You may find that you may have also some questions um, about um, this evening's presentation. Thank you, Lizzie. Envisioning new team programs for my museum and to learn how to inspire and incorporate social justice themes. A lot of different reasons, but what I'm gathering, Susan, and you tell me what you gather is connectivity. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So, um, so let's, um, Oh, great. Thank you, Angela. Let's let's see. Let's see where this leads us today. Um, and thank you for your contributions in the chat. Um, so Beatriz and um, Beatriz and I have been working um, very closely side by side for fresh youth initiatives for five to six years now. Um, and we are part of um, the founding group that um, began the program at Gregorio Luperon High School. Um, so Fresh Youth Initiatives, I'm going to hold on guys. Okay, Fresh Youth Initiatives um, will turn 30 um, next year in 2023. And it was founded by Andrew um, Rubinson in the early 90s. And it began, interestingly, and it's, um, this is a great example on changes and transitions um, organizations need to make throughout their development and their growth. Um, Andrew Rubinson began um, by creating a group of, of youth here in the Heights. And what they started with was um, literally cleaning the community, um, doing projects like removing graffiti, painting mailboxes, um, gardening in our in the local parks here in the community. Um, and eventually, um, what started out as a small group um, eventually grew into a group of 250 participants. And in two th and in early 2000s, FYI actually purchased from the city the building that Beatriz and I are in today. I'm on the fourth floor. Beatriz is in the art studio um, down in the basement level. And we currently service 1,300 families in the community. Uh, we have 
Elementary, um, we have elementary school programming um, nearby, three blocks away at PS 128. We have an, a middle school program in Amistad. And we also um, work with PS, um, with middle school 319. Um, and Gregorio Luperon High School. And we also have programming um, based out of our building here at five, which we call 505, which is 505 West 171st Street. Um, so we, the organization has grown a lot. Um, the organization has grown quite a bit um, in the past six or seven years. Um, we, the exercise that Beatriz, the mindfulness exercise Beatriz opened the session with was one of the exercise, one of the exercises you can find on our website, which garnished a great deal of attention, um, as a result of the pandemic, it became one of our central pen, uh, projects throughout the pandemic. And I'll, we'll speak a little bit about that, um, a little bit about that. So, um, We have different programmings at different at different sites, and there will possibly possibly be a new school added for um, for next year. Um, but six years ago, Executive Director Eileen Lyons um, got they got a grant from DYCD to start an after school program um, at Gregorio Luperon High School, which is located um, six blocks away on 165th Street. And Amsterdam. It's a beautiful high school, um, and it, but it is um, pretty much focused on children who have recently arrived to the country, particularly in the first five years that we um, that we ran the program out of Gregorio Luperon. It was for students who had had recently arrived to the country and it had not been in the country for more than two years. Um, we pretty much, Beatriz can attest to this, we speak Spanish all day um, in servicing our students and working with our students and our families and the faculty and staff. And what was initially um, supposed to be an after school program very quickly, given the needs of the school, um, became, um, which we are right now, we are operating out of the school as a community-based organization. You know, we're nestled in the school. Um, Mondays through Thursdays from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. and on Fridays from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. So that includes during um, daytime during the day programming and then also after school and our evening sports program, which is very popular. So six years ago, um, I am the, um, the executive director, Eileen, Eileen, pretty much said to me, can you go down and assess, informally assess what the school needs? And so in, upon one of my first visits, I actually spoke to the guidance counselors and a few things be, they made, they were very clear on what the school needs were. So there were three guidance counselors at the time and their responsibilities had to do more with um, taking care of students' academic needs and transcripts um, and, um, you know, making sure that students fulfill their requirements for graduation. And um, one thing that was very apparent um, based on the conversations and it was like a quality, a quality assessment, well, what do you need? Um, the one common theme was we need social emotional support. Um, we don't have the manpower to, um, to you know, provide um, social, emotional, and mental health support to the students. The other thing that was also made very clear to the organization in these conversations was that students considered um, the school a second home. And they even said, joking, but it's actually uh, very true, is that if you have programming till 8 p.m., students will stay until 8 p.m. because this is a second home and a safe space for them. Um, so two things became very clear. And so I continued conversations with, um, with um, different stakeholders and it became very clear to me that um, part of um, part of what needed to happen was I needed to establish as a program director is um, relationships with as many stakeholders as, as possible, and that is that was a strategy. 
that's a, what that's one of the strategies you want to talk to you want to talk to as many people as possible in the building um and so um the idea of the high school being a second home to the students was also very much aligned is very much aligned with um with the vision and 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 part of what fyi does here at 505 at 171st street it's the same idea um andrew rubinson was thinking about the idea of the organization becoming a second home um to to the participants so we um so one of the wonderful things about working with the administration at Gregorio Luperon was they did not hesitate to provide us with um, a space to work out of, office spaces to work out of. We um, actually currently have um, office uh, three office spaces in the building, which allow for us to do um, individual counseling and advisory or and group counseling and advisory. Um, and so in designing um, the program, so as you're looking at the slides, as you're looking at these slightly faded photographs, um, Beatriz and I wanted to give you a feel of spaces and Beatriz is gonna talk a little bit more about the necessary, the necessary changes and shifts in the provision of mental health services um to um in order to best support the you know to best support the um the population um so one of the uh one of the fun things actually i don't even see it as a challenge one of the one of the exciting things about um directing the, the directing the program um is it's almost like putting together a puzzle um because you have um you have requirements from funders. We have private funders and we have city, state, and federal, we get city and state and federal funding. Um, private funding allows us for some wiggle room with programming, um, but you have um, what you need to report, what you need to demonstrate to different grants. Um, you also, but then you also have the needs of the school and what the school is telling you that they need academically and in terms of enrichment um and so and then also what the students are um are expressing um expressing an interest in and one of the wonderful things about working so closely in collaboration with with the administration with the principal um Yesenia, um de la rosa cardoza is been that we've worked very closely in this in in uh, not only designing and putting together and implementing and, and running programming, but making the necessary changes um, as the years have progressed. Sometimes the requests from the administration and the school um, that are um, more academic fo focused are very specific. Like um, I will, you know, they will approach us and ask, can we find tutors that will specifically focus on supporting our students whose first language is Spanish in learning a little bit about test taking strategies to um, to take the regents um, in order to because the regents are a requirement um, to um, to you know graduate from high school so sometimes the request will be very specific and sometimes the request will be for for a short-term basis for several weeks or sometimes um, year long for um, a long term long term basis. So the students' interest, what the what the faculty and staff um, are recommending and suggesting, along with with the grant, you kind of, we have to kind of constantly figure out how to if it's like like a three dimensional puzzle, you have to constantly adjust it and and continuously figure figure it out. One of the ways that we get feedback, immediate feedback, is um, we attend. Um, so we have a core, a core staff of um, four or five people that are full time that are at the school, Beatriz being one of them, um, and so that are that are there, you know, pretty much nine to five. And one of one of the ways we get immediate feedback is we attend the weekly cabinet meetings that are um, facilitated and run by. Principal de la Rosa. We also um, we also attend the monthly school 
um, leadership team meetings in which you have a lot of different stakeholders, you have, um, and it's um, faculty and staff along with parents and students who have all gathered information from different groups and presented at the, at the um, SLT, school leadership team meeting, and that takes place once a month. Um, in addition, we have a very strong relationship with the parents and um, the family coordinator at the school. And we have um, actually um, done, uh, they meet, the par parent assemblies take place once a month and Gregorio Luperon is rare in that we um, have, um, a, we, our parents attend the assemblies. We have a, a really about 25%. Um, so we have, a, a, there's a total of, of 500, I would say about 530 students at the school. Sometimes we get all the way up to 100 parents at a parent assembly. And they come for workshops and some of them are interactive, but, it, but it's based on what the parents let the family coordinator know that they feel should be that, like a theme or a topic that is addressed or discussed. And, and we actually have facilitated, um, I, I would say about five to six workshops a year. Um, and some of them are very specific, um, how to communicate with your teen, how to talk um, to, how to, how to talk to your teens about sexuality. Um, so there's all, there's different topics and they, they vary from, um, they do vary from year to year. Um, so, so I was talking about getting immediate feedback. It happens in cabinet, it happens at the SLT meetings. Um, we also attend the safety meetings because the core group, the core full-time staff at Gregorio Luperon are all um, they're either, Beatriz is a licensed mental health counselor, and um, the remainder are social workers, and I actually, my training is in art therapy, so we all have um, a clinical, clinical background and clinical training, which um, um, helps a great deal with programming and the way we interact with the students, um, and so um, we we don't we we work in all the different in all the in a lot of different spaces in in the school um and um we work in um some and and we also do a lot of trips that are you know part of enrichment that support um um college you know we we take them we take them to college and we also um do um, activities and, and we also do and one-on-one and -on -one with students in, for, to help them with college um, um, college and also uh, career career readiness. So there's a lot going on um, in terms of the provision of support um, for our students and families. Um, we also work very closely. This is, I, I know you see in this slide presentation, it's an empty office and it's quite messy and disorganized. This is office number 118. And it's um, one of the primary spaces which we work out of and the business manager who also helps coordinate in the afternoon programming is Meli Rosa has been key um, in, um, in helping with programming, with Fresh Youth Initiatives programming at Gregorio Luperon. Um, and one of the things, and then we also work with Ismaili, we work um, and we work with the school with, for example, for this particular week and this particular photograph, there was a coat drive. Um, the school had ordered coats for the students. And so we actually um, help the school during the day with such events. We have, um, the school has also, we, we have also as an organization gotten donations of shoes, um, which we have, um, you know, which we also um, give to the students. And so there's a lot of different activities um, that happen throughout the day in addition to um, group advisory, individual counseling, but we've also become very involved with the, with the assistant principal that handles the safety, um, safety of the school. Um, and we've gotten involved in um, supporting the school with um, crisis and also um, helping manage suspensions um, because historically there have been challenges for 
um, children of color and high rates of suspension. Um, so we have become very much embedded in the school and helping in um, helping illuminate <laughs> um, different aspects of crises and also um, in, in managing um, suspensions. Um, so, um, so we, and then also then in the after school, we have clubs and we have, um, we have as I mentioned earlier, evening sports. When I spoke earlier um, about the different components of programming and the um, re grant requirements, um, we have um, we have been able to, with federal grants, um, request modifications that best suit what is happening on site. And fortunately, the four or five times we've requested grant modifications to change what was originally proposed in a grant, um, we have all have been approved. And one of the biggest changes was um, ask, um, requesting that the, the work that we do during the daytime before or after school also be taken into account in reporting back um, attendance and numbers and student participation. Um, so, and then obviously throughout the pandemic, more um, requests um, for modifications from our funders were made also in order to accommodate virtual programming um, and hybrid programming. So, um, I had a friend once tell me, Fresh Youth Initiatives is the little engine that could. So, um, once we, um, um, we were confronted with the challenge of the pandemic, um, it required, there's the word, we had to shift gears, had to pivot. Um, and so, I wanted to highlight that, um, Given, um, given the needs, um, food needs and support with um, um, applying for different benefits, we saw ourselves in a position, in a position to um, develop and put together assessments. Beatriz, can you talk a little bit about the assessment um, piece that you, you put together with um, Paola and Alessandro to assess the needs during the beginning phases of the pandemic? Sure, so Paola, the clinical director, um, Jerry and I, is a different direct now, Amistad, um, we, we met a few times and we discussed the needs specifically for, for food. But then Paula and I were speaking about how there were other concrete needs that weren't being addressed and something that was super new to all of us, a lockdown, um, and how to access all of these emergency, all of these specific, um, specific to the community, but also specific to all of us. And it was very new, but also long um, historical needs. So thinking about families that were for the first few weeks, um, in, in um, domestic violence situations and just like linking them with appropriate services and what does it look like if you can't go in to a shelter and you just have to rely on phone calls. So when we were developing an assessment tool, it was a combination of food and also screening for risk and um, crisis. And we trained staff across sites how to do these assessments. And it was sort of like an, it became kind of like an intake, I believe, Susan, like as like in addition to the registration form for participants, they also had to complete this um, assessment and that we would then again, have families complete in like 90 days. Initially it was like 30 days because we were going day by day, you know, COVID. Um, and then after a while, when we realized that things were a little bit um, stable, it was 90 days. Yeah. Thank you. And then um, once, um, once we had an, uh, a better picture and idea of what um, the families um, needed, um, then there were also, as part of the assessment, there was also um, a section addressing, um, you know, getting a sense of what were the academic needs. Um, and so um, we actually started uh, um, 
a social services department, which um, is still running. And um, the director of social services, Alessandro Guimaraes, who is a social worker, is still very busy um, day to day. Um, and he also works with us um, out of Gregorio Luperon. Another, um, another, uh, Another part that got a lot of quite got, got a lot of attention was our website, um, and we really um, we gave the website an, uh, a facelift, and the it was updated daily. Um, I did a um, we did a lot of translating for the website, and the website had different components. It had parent resources, it had activities for youth, and also self care resources. And one of the then the exercise, the mindfulness exercise you did earlier was um, for self care, um, focusing on self care. Um, and these um, these pages were updated daily. Um, and so this is actually, this is part of the youth page. So we had videos of activities for students that um, for, for our youth that could, they could do at home um, for different ages, for elementary, um, middle and for high school. So now we're gonna talk about um, the current happenings at Gregorio Luperon. So I'm gonna turn it over to Beatriz and, and, we'll, um, and she'll tell us a little bit more about the mental health piece um, for the organization. So um, I guess I'll start where, when I started five years ago, the program had just had a year um, operating and it was one room, two interns and Susan. <laughs> one of the interns became the clinical director and the other one now is the social service um, director, Paola and Alessandro. And when I came on board, the first thing Susan said was, it's kind of chaotic, so bear with us. <laughs> like, and I took that to heart because I was coming from a place of um, traditional mental health, you know, where it's, you have your sessions and it's very, your, your client is going to come, you know, you're, you're, you're going to have your agenda and it's, um, worked in a mental health clinic where you bill, and then I've worked with attorneys where it's, but your clients are going to come, expect clients. What I learned really quickly was that this is mental health on the fly. <laughs> this is drive-by therapy. This is, we're doing advisory groups during the day and sprinkled throughout, we're doing crisis work and um, also individual sessions in the stairwell or on a trip that we might be going to and then you have um, an after school activity that you're leading. So for me, my baby is anime. And in my anime sessions, in my anime groups, it's been um, these deep conversations about identity. And it has not changed in the five years that I've been leading them, um, which is very reflective of the age group also, teens, right? So when I started, we were just mostly doing advisories. I believe there were some individuals and crisis work, but it, our, our relationship with the teachers became one where we were being called in for crises by the school liaison. We were, we went from, oh, you know, if you want to check in with the student to we need you right now, like, please come to this room and pick up this child. And it replaced in a way this, um, the unfortunate school prison pipeline situation that happens with, um, having police presence in schools, right? Where we became buffers in a way. And we became kind of like the bridge between the school, the families, the, the student. And to speak to what uh, Susan was, uh, was saying earlier, our clinical approach is school-based family systems. And what fancy speak <laughs> really means is the student, the participant is our client, but so it within context of the school. So the family is also considered the school is also considered and all these dynamics at play and how it impacts the, um, the student's mental health. So we went from, you know, having these one-on-ones with teachers that are talking to us about a referral to this child is also making me feel X, Y, Z. So Susan earlier spoke about um, how we have been invited to do workshops and how we've been invited to do um, going into classrooms beyond just advisories and leading, taking over a class for two days and doing social emotional, which is a very buzzword, but it's, it's huge equity and social emotional in the, in, um, in the academic um, world. Um, 
where we have these curriculums that center the participants as part of the community, but also have them do a lot of like introspective work and how they are, yes, you're part of this community, but you're also your own person, how these relationships finish part transactional and how they impact each other. Now, um, we, we are open, we are providing services to the entire school. It's four of us, <laughs> but somehow we do it. We do it through a lot of workshops, a lot of the advisories, um, the trips help. The, trip, the trips are these informal ways of gathering information, but along the way, you have these like five minute opportunities to do, um, to have these conversations that are therapeutic. I'm, I'm gonna call them therapeutic. Um, they're not therapy session, they're very informal um, mental health supports that eventually result in a much more formal way of our participants receiving uh, mental health services, like the ongoing individual or the family services. If they, I can't think of other related to this, but um, our clinical model is um, addressing this, this mental health disparity that exists within the, the black and brown community, where it's you know, addressing the culture of stress piece. A lot of our students, a lot of our families are recently immigrated to the States, like Susan said, but also might have been here for many years, but they're kind of straddling this like bicultural identity um, uh, reality, right? And because staff, ourselves, like we are, but we live very parallel lives to our, our, our client. We try to be mindful of what that is when we do our, uh, when we provide services because, um, not because, but we have these really hard conversations I, I've learned throughout the last four years um, where we talk about privilege and we talk about um, oppressive systems that in, in a school setting and it, that are interactional, that are very specific and very minute. And what I mean by that is that how in a school setting, our participants learn about the historical context of whatever situation, right? About slavery, about things in the Americas. Um, and then they create, they talk about policies and then they create projects that connect timeline, right? To the past, present, to what could be in the future. So they use their imagination in that way. But what we're doing, the work that we're doing is, is a lot of connecting the emotional piece to this timeline, right? So we ask as gatekeepers in a way, like we're, sh we're, we're you can't share privilege, right? You can't give away your privilege, but you're informing um, the participants through these little interactions, um, how, what power sharing looks like, right? Like. I am a woman of color, you're a, woman of, you're a child of color, and we have these parallel experiences. Um, I grew up in the neighborhood, you live up the block, and we like the same foods, and yet you're experiencing X, Y, Z. Let's bring it to the, to the room, let's talk about it. It's a way of normalizing and reducing stigma. And that's really what our goal is. Because, you know, when I think about when Susan invited me to, to, to chat with her, and she talked about so I mean, social justice and advocacy. And I was like, duh, we do this, but <laughs> how do you frame this language around this? And I think a lot about what equity and mental health is and social justice um, and mental health and, you know, and, and language about ab abolishing systems. And yes, absolutely. We have to undo everything, but what does it look like in the meantime, right? Um, undoing oppressive systems, systems that are historically harmful to communities of color, involves having hard conversations, step one, acknowledging power and privilege, absolutely. But then what? Having core foundational conflict resolution skills, which I think is what we're doing when we're called in to buffer, <laughs> you know, when we're not, um, the first step isn't, oh, we're going to just suspend this child. You know, let, we're, we're, the first thing that comes to the principal's mind or to the school liaison uh, safety officer's mind is, let's call in FYI, let's call in the social workers, let's talk about things before it gets to a much, um, uh, much more challenging space, right? And 
I think also having um, transparency and flexibility is how we've been operating as an organization and also clinicians. We don't have therapy in an office. We don't <laughs> all the time. Sometimes we like, we'll say, hey, we're gonna meet with you in room 118, but oh, we might have to meet in um, the teacher's lounge or whatever. And it's, it, when I first started as a, as a you know, classically trained person, I was caught off guard with that. I was like, what in confidentiality is it? Like, what nightmare is this? But the truth is that it, it's, it's, a, it's a way of, when I first started, the teachers were kind of like, okay, I'll share the room, but they're over here. But they came to understand that, oh no, this is a space. This is important and we need to honor this. Uh, so now it's, it's value to the, to the, to the point where now students know, okay, they're having a private conversation or a teacher says they're having a private conversation. And we we're, we're given that corner. We're given that silence. We're given, um, the opportunity to talk about things when before it was very much, um, you got to fix this, you got to fix this child, manage his behavior. Uh, what I've also learned through the five years that I've been in FYI is that um, el, <laughs> this, this idea, the, the reason why we, um, we use flow y movimiento, right, is, is being flexible and being able to adapt where, yes, the room is a big deal because it's a, it's a confined space, but it's reflective of the immigration patterns and the living conditions that um, are many of our participants that's the reality, right? Um, but also the, the energy that we give into it. Like we have these really long days that the moment we walk in, we're like, okay, this is crisis mode because we see it on the adult's faces when we come in. And then there's a child that might be crying that might not be a participant, but we still ethically are responsible for them. And then you also have a group. So it's, it's, it's the openness and the desire to, to be present with community, but then also being mindful of your boundaries and your own mental health and self-care, which is also something very important that I find that's so different from FYI is that we talk about community care. We talk about what it means to be part of a community. I live and I work and I send my kids to school. I go to school in the community and I bump into all my, with all, all my participants at least once a day like I like and that is so wild and before I never saw anybody that I uh, provided a service for um and for me what that means it reminds me of you know we are all connected and how important this idea of belongingness is um to uh that comes up a lot as a theme with our participants and our students and understanding the biculturalism that comes with like not being othered, you know, and, and them seeing an opportunity of a, a, an example of what it means to be a brown or black person in America, in New York City specifically, um, leads to these wonderful conversations about identity and about future and about fears and about the now and, and the tomorrow. So Susan's been sharing some photos um, this is, I think, from Latin America, Central South America Day, right? Yes, yes, this is it. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. So um, there, we're slowly witnessing a shift in population. And the school was predominantly um, uh, in, um, students from Dominican Republic. Um, and now we are seeing more students from Central and South America. And this year, um, we um, have four students who um, arrived um, unaccompanied through the border. Um, so that we are seeing a change in population. So in September, our clinical director felt very strongly about celebrating um, uh, the independence of Central America. So I've slowly been showing um, images and photos as Beatriz has been speaking. Um, and we've done a lot of different activities. Um, Beatriz and I were talking um, earlier about how it seems as though after the pandemic and the children returning to school um, in person, 
Um, standalone events seem to garnish a lot of attendance and attention. So once again, we've had to make those adjustments, uh, adjustments in, in programming. Um, and so um, like we've had standalone events like self-defense um, and, you know, um, a lot, and other, other events such as fairs and trips. Um, and the other thing that the clinical team um, based out of Gregorio Luperón does is we do um, trainings for other sites, um, other sites, the elementary and middle, middle school site will, um, the directors will ask us if we, um, a lot of times it's focused around behavior um, and classroom management um, and um, in after school. Um, and many times we make, um, we have, we, uh, the PD, the professional development piece is interactive. Um, and there's... <laughs> We do, group, we do group costumes for Halloween, but um, the, Halloween. we plan them early on. There's many discussions had right now around this. So was, yeah, so in 2019, the Chavo del Ocho, the Mexican show El Chavo del Ocho was honored. And then in 2021, the Avengers. Um, and we literally, uh, the team, they call each other the Avengers to group whenever, you know, whenever we have to come together. Um, and there's something to be said for long-term relationships within a team um, and employee retention <laughs> along with um, group cohesion in, in working as, as a team and sometimes gets bumpy, but for the most part, we, um, we actually are a very cohesive group um, at Gregorio Luperon. Um, Beatriz, is there anything else you would like to add? I'm here, I'm keeping track of the time. I yeah, no, I just want to emphasize this art piece because when I walked into Luperon, um, the art there is beautiful. The current principal is doing a wonderful job with, um, Isenia de la Rosa, with, um, with the photos. She loves her photos and her collages. I am here for that. But this piece, when I walked in, I was like, wow, this school, I'm seeing images of part of my history and there are other photographs throughout the school and there's this beautiful mural at the cafeteria that I think it's 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 like a collage of boats and you know as diasporic people where a lot of our the imagery and stories that we hear are of pain you know and and to see yes pain but also resilience and also survival and also um, existence. Like there are other photographs that are just the day to day in the campo in the country in the Dominican Republic. Um, it's refreshing, you know, when you go into a space um, that might lead to, to homesickness. I definitely see that. Uh, but I think allows for this, the participants and for staff that are mostly, I believe, from Latin America and the Caribbean um, to still, it's almost like a bubble. Right, we talk a lot about the the, the loop it on bubble and the work that we do is to act as bridges through that struggle of acculturative stress. So, anyway, I just really like this piece. <laughs> it's like my favorite, <laughs> and it's in the um, school. And yeah, and so in in wrapping up and in in um, doing um, this uh, um, presentation for Dykeman Farmhouse Museum. Um, uh, we would like to also acknowledge the fact that museum spaces, cultural spaces also um, become part of the care of the community um, and also become a holding space. And we can't lose sight of that. That's very important um, because it's, it's, we're all taking care of each other. Um, so, um, Beatrice, is there anything you would like to add to that? Um. <laughs> On that note, we are applying, we're about to open up a mental health clinic. So we are expanding services. So if you are a creative therapist, a mental health counselor, a social worker, you're just interested in mental, please, please hit us up. So just an email, something. We'll look at resumes. We'll consider at this point. Thank you. Interested, yeah. Thank you both. Um, if anyone has, any of our attendees have some questions, feel free to hit the Q&A button and add them in there and we'll make sure that um, our fantastic speakers can answer them. Um, one, one question we have here is, um, how have the parents responded to your presence at the school um, in the years that you've been there? Um, actually, uh, when we 
it's been a very positive response when we started facilitating workshops at the um, monthly parent um, assemblies. Um, I was honestly surprised, you know, we would, we would do the workshop and we are approached in, by individual parents asking us all sorts of different questions from, um, I've been asked, you know, my child, I think my child is using their cell phone too much. What do I do? And that ended up being a workshop um, about the generational differences and uses of technology to um, I'm, I'm really having a difficult time um, with um, maybe some aspect of the um, social services piece, whether it be food or covering rent or um, just help filling out paperwork. Um, um, so I, I, we get approached about a lot of different things. And so um, it's actually worked out very well. Um, and actually our, the family coordinator that joined us this year um, came to our office and was like, well, you guys are popular and then, you know, the parents want workshops or requesting um, that you facilitate workshops for parent assembly. So um, the parents have actually been um, a very, um, have been very welcoming. That's great. And um, another question is, do you see your programs expanding to um, kids of different age groups? Is the school that you're at now uh, middle or high? It's high school. And um, one of my um, one of my responsibilities as um, deputy director of institutional growth is to um, we are to duplicate this model at um, at you know at another site. So it's a big it's a it's a big task. It's very possible we do have sites nearby that we know would be good um, would be great. Um, not candidates, um, um, partners, we, we could form a partnership with it. We could form something very similar that's not just a self-contained after school. Mm -hmm. And actually what you just said kind of leads into the next question I have here, which is sort of, do you see this program as something that's repl replicable? And are there, you know, I mean, obviously you, you, your organization is only able to do so much, right? With the you know, there are a lot of schools that you could be working with in our community um, and you would have to have, you know, an insanely large staff to be in every school. Are there other um, organizations that do similar work to you or do you see yourself, your organization as kind of um, trend setting? There are or other organizations that do similar work. I think what sets, sets us apart is that our core staff are all um, our, um, our core full time staff at the Gregorio Luperon High School site are all support services, mental health, um, mental health service providers. And so it, we're I think we're present in a different way that other um, other other programs are that make sets us apart from other programs because we're directly involved not just seeing children for counseling we're involved in all aspects of programming and so i that's what sets us apart it's interesting how that um how well that social emotional component dovetails with almost any <laughs> educational program so it's amazing work that you're doing. How, how large is the FYI staff altogether? Altogether, um, I think we have about across all sites, uh, everyone, I think it's somewhere between 65 and 70. Yeah. Yes. Wow. And, 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 and it, we've expanded and we've grown a lot, you know, so like Beatriz said, we, you know, if you, you want to send us, you know, you can look at the website and, and we're, welcoming resumes because there's different opportunities. And the wonderful thing about working for the organization is if you are of a creative mind and spirit and you wanna be involved in the shaping of something, um, this is the place to work at, <laughs> which has been really great actually. Really amazing and fascinating work. I'll give people a minute in case anybody has any other questions they'd like to ask. So what is the, um, the facility that you're going to be opening? When, when is that opening and what, what is its charge? Um, 
we are projecting that it'll be done within the next 12 to 14 months. Um, we are in the process of, we've already um, conduct, uh, had our first interview and meeting with the state, which have to approve um, the process of us applying. And so we are, um, we're about to complete the application, which has been a very um, lengthy process. And our executive um, director has been um, act very actively working on, on the application. Um, for the past uh, for the past few months, and so once that application goes in, then the state will then give us the feedback. But the state, when we met with them the first time, where they were actually pretty much saying yes to us in the first five minutes, they were very excited about the possibility of a mental health clinic um, in 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 this community. That's amazing! I can't wait to follow the progress and do more with you at the museum. So this has all been great. Um, thank you so much, Susan and Beatriz, for this fantastic discussion. I hope that everyone enjoyed it. Um, please consider making a donation to enable us to continue to offer free public programming. Gifts in any amount are appreciated. I'd also like to remind you that tonight's conversation is the third of four conversations in our Talking About Race Matters Join the Conversation series. Join us here next Wednesday at 6 p.m. here on Zoom. Be sure to register through the links in the chat and follow us on social media for updates. We will see you here next Wednesday, which is March 2nd at 6 p.m. for the American Plate, Race, Place, Taste, and the Future of Food Equity by Aura Kemp. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your evening. Thanks. Thanks.